Hello and welcome to another world famous video from the Word of God Ministries explaining whole Bible Christianity. I'm Bruce Bertram. God's gracious law is a perfect gift with a number of benefits attached that we also call blessings. We'll talk about three more of them in this video and a total of 24 in all the videos in this series. They're not the only blessings but they're a good cross-section. We get benefits when we get the law. God's purpose is to bless, and His law has tremendous blessings. Some only get a few benefits because they only accept a little of what God has to offer. But if we plunge in with whole hearts, we will gain the approval of our Father and we reap a full harvest of blessings, pressed down and overflowing. Just like the Rechabites we talked about in the first video of this series. So the next blessing we'll talk about is that it's love. So, speaking of immersion and submission, Jesus says that his disciples abide in his love by doing what God says. It is written, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. John 14, 23, and 24. And again, Jesus says, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15, 9 through 10. According to Jesus, God's word, or law, is the same as Jesus' words. There are not two different words for two different peoples. The words we hear from Jesus are the Father's words, and Jesus speaks what God tells him to speak. So we abide in the love of the Father and the Son when we take in what they say and do it. Love is the aim of everything a believer does. As we do what he says, he makes his abode, or abides, with us, and we abide in love with each other. It is written, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. 2 John 4-6 through six. The beginning that James speaks of is not the alleged beginning of the church, but the beginning in the garden. His commandments are not some abbreviated or changed version of the law, but the eternal law itself. God's love, excuse me, God's law to love one another has always been around. It just hasn't always been followed. The message has always been, walk in it. Remember that when Jesus says to eat his body and drink his blood, John 6, 50-58, he is saying that hearing and doing is like partaking of him. Each time we obey a command, we make another connection to God and to each other. The more we obey, the more we abide. It is like the food we eat distributed to every cell in our body, keeping our life going. The more we bring in what he says to daily living, the more it helps us take every thought captive. It is written, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 It doesn't matter if the testament is old or new. There is an implied obligation, not from fear, but from love. It is not lip service, nor is there a take-it-or-leave-it option. God's child is obliged to follow God's word in their completeness because God gives us so much love. It is reasonable to love God back by giving him obedience with all of our heart, mind, or soul, and strength. In view of his love and sacrifice for us, it doesn't make any sense to ask, do I have to follow the law? 
as the apostle has written little children let us not love with word or with tongue but in deed and truth we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us for God is greater than our heart and knows all things beloved if our heart does not condemn us we have confidence before God and whatever we ask we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us 1 John 3, 18-24 The next blessing up to talk about is that the law is worship. And this is a good place to talk about the blessing of worship. If you look in the word, gee, what a concept. Worship is generally spoken of in connection with doing what God says. Worship, obedience, and blessing go hand in hand with humility and truth. It is written, but an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John 4, 23-24 And again, Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Luke 4, 8 we worship or serve God when we do what he says. Obedience is the most basic form of worship and the one form that he desires above all others. There is no gray area. We are either for him or against him. For he who is not against us is for us. Mark 9, 40. We cannot roll around on the ground, sing songs with tears, give money, or speak in mysterious languages yet ignore his word, and then expect these histrionics will be acceptable worship. We may acquire the fire, but it won't keep going without loving obedience to fuel it. Acquiring the fire is easy. Tending it throughout the years is a lot harder. If you had a child that spoke of how wonderful, wonderful you were as a parent, then went out and behaved in ways that displeased you, would you think the way they spoke about you was genuine? If you had a spouse that spoke of devotion to your face, but behind your back was getting in bed with other people, would you think the devotion was genuine? <laughs> God is not so stupid either. Many times Israel is chastised by God because their worship of him consisted of mere lip service. They would go through the motions of sacrificing, then do things that were directly against what God had commanded. The church has not escaped the same fault, nor will we escape the same judgment if we continue in it. Worship of God was and is always to be done with a whole heart in every action. Loving the Lord includes all our heart and soul and strength. As it is written, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Worship can include singing or what have you, but for these outward expressions to be genuine, they will be coupled with an inside condition of obedience. They spring from a right relationship with God. When we obey God in the smallest area, it is worship. In this way, we can worship him minute by minute by following as many of the commands as we can. We don't need a special building with special music team and special leaders. We don't have to have worship music on the radio or something either. We don't need signs and wonders. Obedience is the key to worship. It's abiding as a living sacrifice. That Romans 12, 1 through 2 section again. Are we also glad of heart in the doing? Sure. Obeying God imparts life and brings forth joy on a regular basis, and we express this joy in song. Are we thankful? Oh yeah, especially when we think about all he has done for us. But worship is as regular as breathing and is not limited to a few songs on Sunday or grace before a meal. As it is written, For to this end I also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, 
whether you are obedient in all things. 2 Corinthians 2, 9. Cracks me up when we sing songs in the church with su subjects that sound godly, but then we refuse to actually do what we sing. Anywhere you go, I'll follow, at least till we get out the door. <laughs> he makes a right turn and we make a left. I like music. I play drums and guitar. I enjoy rocking out on occasion. Most drummers are a little nuts. My CD collection would get me thrown out of a lot of churches. <laughs> the sad thing is, I'd been part of music teams that said music was an offering to God, yet refused to offer their best effort in practicing or showing up on time. I've been barred from other music teams because I wasn't holy enough. Others told me I couldn't produce a spirit of worship in a fashion acceptable to them. I'm not big on endless repetitions after reading Matthew 6-7. I've been hammered for playing secular music, whatever that means, and rejected for playing and not playing hymns. As a matter of fact, my perspective is that there is a lot of ungodliness in the music programs of most of the visible church. It's amazing that any part of it comes together in such a way as to please God at all, much less make it acceptable to Him as worship. It might please the people who are doing it, but I wouldn't expect it to please God. Not any more than sacrifices mixed with iniquity, Isaiah 1, 10 through 17. Worshiping God is constant, and sometimes we sing too. The next blessing is that the law trains our hearing. The more we follow the written form of God's ways, the better we can hear when he speaks to us outside of the word. In other words, if we don't pay attention to what he already said, how would we hear it if he told us something additional? For instance, if we ignore his word on what we eat, how would we hear his response when we prayed for healing? He is our physician and healer, and he gives us preventative medicine in his law. He doesn't always answer our prayers with miraculous cures. Sometimes he just has to tell us to stop being stupid about what we stick in our mouths. If we don't listen to his prescription, we'll just keep getting sick. Some preach the opposite. Eat whatever we feel like, then pray for a miracle when we get sick. If it doesn't work, then it must be your fault. You don't have enough of some mystical ingredient they call faith. Well, duh. But the reason the faith isn't working is that we are ignoring the obedience part in the first place. Our hearing gets sharper when we practice listening to his written word. We have to develop the spiritual hearing muscles of humility and obedience. We get used to the sound of his voice from the word, so we can automatically distinguish his voice from all the other chatter around us. Just like a young child can tell the difference between mom's voice and others in a crowded room. When God speaks directly to us, the character of what he says will match the character of his written word, and we pick it up by association. The law trains us in righteousness so that rightness always stands out for us no matter where we see it or hear it. Besides, what is the big deal with doing what our Father says, even in minor details? A few holidays, what we eat, and some clothing choices don't seem like all that huge of an issue, do they? No, they aren't. What does make a big difference, however, is our attitude about God's Word. Either it is all important, or none of it is. We can't get all mystical about Christ lives in us, then ignore the things that He commanded us at least not and have an effective walk with him. If we keep making excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse to dodge his word, we will miss out on life and that more abundantly. We will also continue to present a hypocritical and cracked up picture of our father to others. We end up driving the rest of the world away from what they desperately need also. Doesn't dad, the father, have a right or a fatherly responsibility to tell us what is right and wrong, what is good and bad, what is clean and unclean. That's what I do with my kids. How else should our father deal with his children? Birth them into new creations and leave them by the side of the road? Give them a few vague instructions like love your God and neighbor and then let them go off by themselves? It doesn't make any sense at all. We don't treat our own kids like that. 
God loves us and provides guidance for growing and strengthening the life that he gives us. We can love him back by adoring every word he speaks and striving to put it everywhere in our lives that it belongs. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that we have something like his law to tell us where the boundaries are, where we should go and where we shouldn't go, so we don't go wandering off into the wilderness or off a cliff like so many people do? God never intends for his people to stand in one place once we gain right standing with him. <laughs> he wants us to move. The beginning of our movement should be in taking on all of his ways as spelled out in his law. It is the best discipleship system ever designed and is guaranteed to produce fruit that is pleasing to God. The Holy Spirit uses it to tutor us in the way we should go and when we get all grown up, still functions to guard and protect. His word is the foundation on which we can build a house that honors him in every area. His law is love in action. And through it, we learn how to love him and how to love others as well. As we obey each command, we touch our Lord and Master and friend, and he touches us. From this flows worship, thanksgiving, praise, and testimony to his provision and blessed love. It is no big deal to incorporate all of God's requirements for holy living, because he doesn't ask very much of us. As our Father, of course, he's not going to leave us hanging after making us new creations. He shepherds us with tender loving care, making boundaries and warning us away from dangerous situations. Thank you for watching. We've got more videos and a website at www.wholebible.com with a draft of our book, Whole Bible Christianity. Subscribe to our channel, please, and register on our blog for continued conversation. Or give us some comments, constructive comments, please, below. Shalom.